We talk a lot about the mechanics of coaching, but what you end up actually doing as a coach, particularly if you're working with somebody over a long period of time, has less and less to do about those mechanics and more and more about the people that you're connecting with. The people that are best at understanding who they are and what they value are actually gonna be the ones that are most effective out in the market. You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome back to Barbell Logic. This is producer Trent, and you are hearing my voice because today we are airing a lecture that one of the Barbell Logic coaches gave at a recent PBC, Professional Barbell Coach Seminar, at the Strength Parlor in St. Louis, Missouri. So our very own Andrew Jackson gave a lecture to the students there about coaching and specifically what it means to be a professional barbell coach. So we've talked about many times in this podcast what the nuts and bolts of coaching are. Things like programming and technique and how to evaluate how a lifter's doing with a program, both physically in terms of how they respond, but also emotionally and mentally. But there's another side of professional coaching that is how are you actually doing this as a business, as a business owner, as a freelancer, as a gym owner. And as Andrew explains, part of the goal of the professional barbell coach certification is to create coaches that are in tune with their own values and the types of people that they like to help and the types of people that they want to serve and the types of problems they want to solve as a coach and then linking that up with those clients so that you get coaches that are engaged and excited about what they do and you get clients that match up with these coaches not just on a technical level in terms of learning the barbell lifts and getting stronger and seeing improvements in their body composition, all that stuff, but also that connect with these coaches on a mental and emotional level too. So that's what we're going to listen to today. We're going to hear Andrew's lecture. I have edited it down to fit better into a podcast format, but Andrew is going to reference several slides in the presentation he was giving these students. If you want to see that slide deck, Go to the show notes and there will be a PDF you can download there and follow along. So I hope you enjoy this and I hope it gives you some food for thought about what a coach really is. Many of you out there are interested in becoming a coach or you're out there actively coaching now and you're wondering how to improve, how to become a better coach from a technical perspective, but also from a business perspective as well. So hopefully you can learn something from this. Let's get right to it. All right. Let's get going. The bulk of the lecture today is going to be on uh, the professional barbell coach. When I took this line off of our website, the business of helping people become stronger, that's from our uh, core values page at Barbell Logic. And I think that it, it really kind of, it captures what I think the professional barbell coach is is doing and what it is that we want people with, that are pursuing this certification and earn this certification to be doing with their work. And as I was thinking about what goes into uh, being a professional barbell coach what and what we have as a community, it, there were really five components to it that I want to talk about tonight. Um, two of which we've historically spent a lot of time talking about. That's how we teach the movement why we use the model that we do and, and how and the mechanics of what you do on the platform to get somebody moving in accordance with that model. The other is everybody's favorite thing to argue about on the internet, and that's programming. The sets and the reps and the exercises, which we sometimes glaze over, but why we do the squat press bench and the and the deadlift are some are things that we have explanations for. We have models for why we do those exercises, including the programming that we use. The pieces that we don't talk a lot about are really on the, um, the business side, how we make a profit as a coach, actually being a professional with these tools, the teaching and the programming, what we do as coaches throughout our career to become better coaches and, and ultimately the coach that we really want to be or that we're striving to be, 
and how we think about the things that we value and create a, a purpose for what it is that we're doing with our coaching. How we, how we choose the people and the type of coaching that we want to that we want to do so that we actually feel like we're doing something meaningful in our work that we're connecting with people and that's something that we often don't talk about is you the coach as a person your client the people and it's something that i think matt has really emphasized and brought to the the industry with barbell logic is that people matter Barbell Logic is a people company. It talks about that a lot. Right? We don't just do what we're doing because we're trying to make money. We're also trying to make the world a stronger place. We're trying to connect coaches with people. So we both serve the market and get, getting a client connected to a good coach. And we're also working on getting coaches connected with the clients that they love to work with. So let's walk through those. Teaching the movement. So one of the things that we've done within the academy is deconstruct what is actually happening on the platform. And that's represented by this black box model. Why is that useful? So the, to me, this is important because we're trying, what this is tr doing, what this is trying to do is take what has historically been where the answer is, how do I get better at coaching? Will you coach more and provide an actual system to you guys as coaches. This is something unique to the Academy and what we provide and talk about in that process to try to actually deconstruct what you're doing on the platform, going through those steps of observing what's happening, recognizing, looking for the deviation of the model and um, selecting the right cue to try to fix that. One of the things that, I've seen, I mean, you guys may have seen this as well. If you ever had somebody who you're either watching the coach and, or you're experiencing this yourself where somebody's watching you and they have no idea how you saw and came up with that cue, right? Because you're doing this without even thinking about it. And that, that's what we try to do with this is look at the master coach who's just like not even hesitating. They instantly spit out the cue that fixes the movement in real time. This is what they're doing, but they've become so fast at it that they're not conscious of it. But what we're trying to do with the academy is get somebody who's brand new to coaching to actually have a process and a system to go through so that they can practice intentionally becoming better at that skill. So what we're doing with both the teaching tools, the black box and the next slide that we'll be talking about is make is giving the giving tools to you guys as coaches so that you can actually intentionally improve your coaching on the platform and not just go out and repeat the same stuff over and over and over again. So you're getting lots of reps, but you're not actually getting any better. This becomes particularly useful if you find yourself with a lifter who's repeating the same error over and over and over again, time to step back, Think about what it is that's going on, figure out what the error actually is, compare that to the model, look through your error list and pick the right cue. So these, what are these things at the bottom are what's feeding into your ability to do this. As you get more coaching experience, you're going to become more effective at this process. Why does lifting experience matter? What about the, uh, the coaching eye piece of it? Have you guys, you guys watched that video as well, right? Have you ever had the experience of trying to cue a lifter and like they don't even know what their knees or what some parts of their body are doing? Well, the same thing's happening with you as a lifter. You're learning more about how your body moves and what that feels like. And you're actually able to more readily recognize movement errors in your clients as well, based on what you've been able to learn from doing the movement itself. And that, that's kind of like the aha moment from the coaching eye video. When you're working with a client, they can't see the error. Like their brain does not recognize the movement error. One, because they probably don't know what good looks like. They don't understand the model. 
Two, they, they, their brain can't compute what's actually happening with the movement. So this becomes a bit of a catch-22 as a coach. What happens when you, as you become more experienced as a coach and a lifter, and then you try to go back and communicate with somebody who's day one lifting? Yeah, have you ever found yourself cueing day one lifter something about putting something into extension or flexion or referring to some kind of anatomical body part? because you've been studying, the, you did the master's anatomy class, but does Nance that's coming in on Sunday <laughs> know what elbow flexion is or wrist extension? So these things are really useful, and yet we also have to make sure that we're selecting good cues and keeping ourselves effective on the platform with a range of lifters. You're going to have your day one lifter, you're going to have your day 300 or your day 600 lifter. The cues that are effective might change over that time. But going through this process is always going to be happening on some level in your brain. And then the, the model, of course, gives us something that we're anchored in that we can have as a standard. I, it's becoming really popular right now. I call it barbell nihilism where it's like, nothing matters, who gives a shit, like we're all just moving random objects through space with random amounts of weight. Um, and, and I think that's BS. I think that we, we live in a world of, uh, that has constraints. We are operating in a world that has gravity that's uh, pulling in a straight direction. We're putting barbells on our back. We have anatomy and physiology and, and mechanics that constrain the system that we're trying to operate efficiently. So there is a way to move that's going to be more efficient than the other way. And I, I'm not saying that one's like safer or more dangerous, but there's definitely going to be a way that we can move that's more optimal for lifting more weight and getting stronger. That's something that we, within the broader fitness industry, have that anchors us in a consistent standard. This is really what we're effectively evaluating you guys on over the next two days. So the better that you can become at this, both in practice and then also conceptually being able to step back and think about that, you know, the more successful you, you or the more effective you can be on the platform. All right, the next slide, uh, for those that have been here before, will probably recognize this as the theory of everything. Um, Anybody having a hard time seeing that in the back? I'm calling this just how to get stronger. These are models for both movement and programming. And this really is what I was talking about on the at the end of the previous slide, that we have constraints and systems, both the physical world and our bodies, that define the models for how we move and the framework for how we program. And that is day to day, the mechanics, the nuts and bolts of what you are doing as coaches on the platform or online, you're getting your move, your lifter to move to in accordance with the model and you're programming week by week or day by day to, to help them get stronger. So we start with this first priority as professional barbell coaches, we want to make the world a stronger place. We want our clients to get stronger. Now that is going to feed into goals and physical objectives that are unique for that individual though, right? So strength is the common principle, but is everybody getting stronger using that for the same end goal or objective? Yes, they are. No, no they're not. <laughs> I know where you're going with it. Right? Like somebody wants to be um, competing in jujitsu. Somebody's going to be a cyclist. Somebody's going to be a rower. Um, somebody just wants to be generally healthy, healthier, right? Strength is going to be the common theme, but we need to feed that into whatever their overall goals are, which then, as this chart is showing, flows into SRI and SAID. So we know that the body responds to the stress that we impose on it that's specific to that stress and that we need to apply that stress, allow some recovery so that the organism adapts to that stress. That is going to be dependent on the goals, 
right? Somebody who's training to be a power lifter is going to need a different stress than somebody who's training to be a weight lifter, right? But the same principles apply. It just helps us think about how we want to choose the, the movements that we're going to be assigning to, the, to drive that stress. That's how we get to our qualitative stress. This is our descriptive stress that ultimately, based on the exercise criteria, gets us to the movements. So we get our, we have our qualitative stress. We that feed that filters through our exercise criteria. We uh, factor in human anatomy, kin kinematics, and mechanics, and from that we get our descriptive model. So we're getting to the low bar squat, the deadlift, the bench press, the press, from this chain of thinking. We want to get stronger. That feeds into our goals and objectives. Then we know in order to achieve those goals, we have to impose a specific stress. Uh, that defines the qualitative stress that we're, we're seeking. We have our exercise criteria. We have our anatomy, kinematics, and mechanics that are getting us to the low bar squat that we teach, the deadlift, the press, and the bench. So when somebody walks in on that first day, we don't have to reinvent the wheel every single time. We know that we've got effective ways of moving weight to help people achieve their goal. So this, this flow, this thinking, um, is important because as a coach, you want to be able to understand why it is you're doing, why you're having your clients do what they do. You're not just randomly having them do squat, press, bench, deadlift. You're doing it because that's the most effective way to get stronger within this constraint, this real world that we live in. So, I mean, when somebody walks in on day one, they've never touched a barbell, their goal and objective is extremely general. This is the most broad, general, basic stress that you can oppose, impose on them so that they can get stronger. Andrew, who's you know late intermediate, early advanced lifter who wants to do a kettlebell swing in a pull-up competition is going to have, he's already completed his novice NLP, he's gone into intermediate programming, and now he has a very specific goal that he needs to prepare for. And it has components of strength required for it. Um, but he's also going to have different fitness goals that need to be programmed for accordingly. So that actually gets us over to the next conversation here that from the stress that we know we need to apply, there's also going to be some kind of quantitative or measurable stress that's going to effectively flowing through our terms and definitions from programming. What are, so what are some terms and definitions? I guess I shouldn't blow through that. When we're talking about programming or individual program, what things do you guys have to manage as coaches? So how many sets and reps you're doing, what weight on the bar, what, in, what intensity that is, um, as well as being influenced by our programming framework, the novice effect, Training versus exercise and MED. What's MED? This, to me, and especially when you're talking about being a professional barbell coach, MED is a massive game changer. Highly recommend if you haven't listened through Matt's uh, master's class um, podcast that you do that because <laughs> as a professional barbell coach, to me, it, it enables you to retain a client for years and keep them progressing and happy and not frustrated without just beating them into the ground, resetting and repeating or program swapping, you know, over and over and over again. You can indefinitely almost adapt to where they are and where they want to go and, and make a custom program. So we've got these, these frameworks of thinking that feed into the quantitative stress, the specific stress. So Andrew wanted to do his kettlebell workout or his kettlebell competition was going to be, it was, uh, it's going to be, it was a five minute, it's probably canceled now, three minute. Uh, if, I, I guess I don't know, we'll, we can talk about it. It, it is five minutes. Five minutes. So five minutes, as many reps as possible. Mm -hmm. So we need to develop a specific 
quantitative stress to prepare him to be able to get as many kettlebell swings as possible. What are we typically doing for most of our clients that are training with barbells? Sets of five. Sets of five is going to be the, the quantity or the, yes, the rep scheme that we're using, but what is it, what quantitative stress are we preparing for, for that, for most people competing? Intensity. Going for their one RM, right? Yeah. Or AMRAP. <laughs> um, <That's possible. laughs> we're trying to. Can, we're try, we're, what we're working on is increasing the stress over time, the cumulative stress of their training over time so that they can get stronger, which we define as basically getting a, a PR. That's the one rep max, three, eight, five, whatever, how many. I like to have as many PR. <laughs> like a whole spreadsheet of PRs so that I can PR all the time <laughs> and post on Instagram that I got a PR. <laughs> now, here's a really important uh, in factor in that program. What are some of the things that need to be taken into account for the individual? Age, individual uh, injuries. Can you give the same program to everybody in this room and get the same result? And, you know, is that individual variability, but those categories that we were just throwing off, is every 40-year-old going to be the same? Is every female going to be the same? This is the other wonderful thing about MED, is that the program, the most effective program for that individual can emerge out of their progress, out of the, their training over time, as you get to tinker with and think about what works, what doesn't work, and, and basically experiment I mean, that was really what it comes down to when you're working with somebody over a long period of time, you're having to test hypothesis uh, for what went wrong uh, or what's working. And what works changes over time, right? The novice three by five progression works really well on day one with somebody. And it may work later, but it might not. You have to go try that out. I've had an advanced lifter who had never experienced a novice linear progression. He was a 500 pound squatter and I put him on an NLP and he added 60 pounds to his, <laughs> his one RM doing an LP because he had never done a linear progression, three sets of five. And so it was a new stress for him. He had been a weightlifter all his life and just basically worked up to heavy singles and call it a day. And so the individual program is going to be something that you get to experiment with on, on to develop for each client. But the important takeaway here is again, that we have models for how we think about the exercises that we choose and the program that we assign. It's not just random. We have specific reasons that are anchored in the physical world and our physiology and the mechanics of our bodies that determine and how our bodies respond to stress that determine the exercises that we use and the program that we select. That's another thing that relatively speaking within the fitness industry is rare. If I go onto the NSCA website or the CrossFit website or Orange Theory website and look at what they're doing for their exercises and their programming, what do you typically see? <laughs> now, I should probably choose my words carefully here because the NSCA has a lot of science-based rationale for what they're doing, but it's a lot of variation. It's a lot of things that they're having their clients do that aren't grounded in concrete rationale for why they're doing it. The common thread between both the black box and this how to get stronger model is that you want to be able to answer the question, why am I doing this? Why am I saying this cue? Why am I choosing these exercises? Why am I programming this way? It's not random. You have a reason. And when something doesn't work, you can go back and try to figure out why it doesn't work because you chose the program and the exercises with a specific stress in mind uh, to get an outcome. Not just throwing random stuff at, at your client 
and you know pulling stuff out of a hopper. So we've talked about the mechanics of teaching the movements and coaching movement. We've talked about the mechanics of why we pick the exercises we do and the programs we do. I'd like to talk a little bit more about the uh, professional coach side of things. We've spent a lot of time and energy talking about why we do what we do for the movements, but we haven't talked a lot about a, what, a lot about why we do what we do as business owners and people that want to make money from this. So the first question when you're wanting to be a professional is how are you going to make a profit? And that's an important distinction. It's not just how you're going to get money. Has anybody uh, gone through the process of starting to charge for their time and they start making income, but then you have to pay for the gym space and you have to drive to the gym and then you drive back from the gym and you have to clean up from the gym. And what you at first thought was reasonable to charge 70 or 80 bucks an hour, when you do the math, you realize that you're actually only making, or you're actually, your revenue is only like 20 bucks an hour and you paid most of that to the gym. So this diagram, this kind of, this model is called the iron law of economics. Each one of these red stripes, you can imagine like if you were to take three pins on your desk or three straws, you can actually play with this physically. Um, represents the parts of the equation for how you need to run any business. If you want to make money, your costs have to be less than your price. That's how you make a profit. Your brand is going to be defined by what your customers or your clients perceive your value. And hopefully that's going to be more than your price. What happens if they don't perceive your value to be more than the price that you're charging? Not gonna pay you. you lose your client. And what gets hard with coaching is that their, your perceived value changes over time. These are not like static things and it certainly don't, it doesn't always perfectly look like this. When you first have your client walk in the door, their perceived value for what you do for them as teaching them the movements and getting them significantly stronger, adding 200 pounds to their back might be pretty high because they don't know what they're doing. They've never done this before. They just know they want to get stronger and they heard that you, you know how to do that. As they start training longer and longer, if all that you do is provide that same service of running them through maybe a lot novice linear progression with the same three lifts, that perceived value is going to shrink more and more and more and more and eventually maybe it overlaps. So you need to be managing your perceived value at all times, making sure that that is more than the price that you're charging. How do you know what your price needs to be? Well, you better be taking into account how much cost you have in order to make profit. So being a professional in any industry is going to be about managing your perceived value so that it's greater than your profit so that you retain your clients and making sure that you're charging enough so that you're actually making a profit because it's greater than your costs. This becomes, I think, an important starting point that we get kind of uncomfortable. Like, we don't want to talk about money. Oh, we're being greedy. Like, but being a PBC is part of this process because maybe it doesn't today. A PBC is a pretty new certification. But going through the process of becoming a PBC is going to increase your perceived value because you can explain to your clients why you're doing what you're doing and you can demonstrate very quickly that you can get them moving in accordance with this model, which they don't really care about, but they know that it doesn't hurt anymore. Like, oh, have you ever, you ever teach somebody the low bar squat using the teaching progression and day one, they're like, that feels so much better. Maybe except for their shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> But you're able to immediately improve your perceived value in an hour because that person walked in the door and all they knew is they wanted to get stronger. Or like Mike said, they had some pain point. And within an hour, 
you taught them how to squat, press, deadlift, and they've got weight on the bar. And all of a sudden they're like doing these movements and they have no idea how that happened. You did it so fast and professionally and smoothly that they want to come back and pay you more money. So this, I think, is an important starting point to make sure that we're just being upfront and thoughtful about what it is that we're trying to do as professionals. We're, we want to make money. We want to make a profit. So we need to be thinking about how we improve that perceived value so that you can charge more and make more profit. You also want to be thinking about your costs. So make sure you're factoring in the, the overhead that you're paying for your gym, um, the equipment that you're purchasing, the time that you're spending going to and from the the gym. Uh, Barbell Logic is a brand that being a PBC, you're associated with this brand now. Again, we're still pretty new and starting out, but we have a website that we can put your name on so people can find you with a podcast that's, you know, thousands of downloads every month um, that people are going to be able to find you and perceive that you can add value or that perceive that you have more value because you've earned this certification. When, if you think about moving, like if you actually set, you, you can take three pins and kind of play with this, you know, on your desk at some point, but you can, you can think about these problems, like different problems that occur as you move those pins around. Uh, if, if the perceived value, and, and so as a specific, as a concrete example, anytime I lose a client that says, I, I just, you know, I was looking at my budget and I can't really afford this anymore. That's like 90% of our clients say that. What are they actually saying? They're, they're actually saying that I don't perceive the value to be greater than the price anymore. So it flips the question back on me instead of just being like, oh, guess I don't have the money anymore. It, it puts it on me to ask myself, how do I make sure that I'm adding enough value to this client that they continue to want to pay? Now, that becomes a bit of a catch or a, it can become um, a problem if you lose sight of the anchors that we just spent a bunch of time talking about because that will eventually end up looking like what Mike's talked about. Well, let's just do a bunch of complex stuff and keep them guessing and wondering what the heck's going on and they'll think it's fancy and they'll think it's more perceived, they'll think it's a higher value and that works. People will pay a lot of money for a personal trainer to have them do a bunch of silly shit. But we want to, as PBCs, we, this is important and we need to be paying attention to the business side of it, but we're still anchored in the teaching model and our reality constraints of being in this world and the bodies that we have, how we get stronger and that strength is what's important. So the question then is, all right, well, I want to make some money being a coach. How, and I want to increase my perceived value. Well, how am I going to do that? Well, uh, this is actually a slide that I took out of our coaches conference last summer, where I talked about uh, creating a culture of learning at Barbell Logic. And I think this is a really useful way of thinking um, about anything that you're trying to accomplish or any goal that you're pursuing. Um, this drawing, what, it, what it's representing here, that's specific to what we're talking about, is that you're all starting out as new strength coaches. At some point, you want to be the ideal strength coach. You want to be the best version of you that you can be as a strength coach. To get there, you're going to have to go through what these loops are representing are a series of failures, learning from those failures, applying learning principles, which where do you, where can you get in the conversation that we've had so far, where can you, what process can you go through to try to develop some learning principles? The black box. Step back. You failed. So what, what's a failure? I mean, every, some, some people get kind of freaked out. It's like it's an opportunity to learn, but like what, so specifically, let's say what you were, somebody was saying, you're repeating the same cue. Your lifter is not getting better. That's failure. And I'm not saying failure is in like, you, you suck, you fail. Failure is just meaning that you're not achieving the goal that you want, or you're not getting the outcome that you want. So something's not working. You can, with the, these tools that we've been talking about, step back, ask yourself why, 
and learn from it. Develop maybe a new cue. That's where it starts to get really fun when you can start thinking about your failures as an opportunity to learn because now you can go back through your black box, but maybe this time you add a new cue. Or maybe you experiment with a different type of cue, different tactile cue, and, and you find something that works better. Now you've made some progress towards becoming a better coach because you're more effective at getting people stronger. And it never stops. The PBC is, this is not the PBC. Like the PBC is like maybe one or two loops. Like there, maybe there's been some failures along the way in even getting the certification. But in that process, you've gotten better. And embracing that failure is a learning opportunity is extremely powerful and something that will benefit you for the rest of your career. Always seeking the opportunity to learn, improve, and set that next goal. How many people here have had a coach before? What, and you think about that coach, like how did that person make you feel working with them? Confident? There's no right answers here. I'm just curious, like what, what you guys experience, because that's going to influence who your ideal coach is. Or then this, your ideal strength coach is specific to you. Like the best coach, you're not going to be me. Uh, like the best version of you as a coach. Like if you tried to act like me, or just you know repeat the things that I do, that's going to that's not going to work because that's not you, right? Does that make sense? But what, what I'm trying to emphasize the you, the your ideal strength coach, because this feeds all the way back into our first conversation when we were talking about what's an effective cue. Because we see this as a, this is common, that people will show up and you can tell they're trying to sound like somebody that they've seen before. They're trying to coach like somebody they've seen before and it doesn't, doesn't work because they're not connecting with the client in a way that's authentic, you know, to use a They're buzzword. Too busy thinking about trying to imitate someone than what's actually going on right in front of them. Right. Right. So they've lost track of paying attention to what's actually happening and they're focused on this being this other thing. They're an actor. Right. Rather than paying attention to what's happening and being an effective coach. Okay, so you might start to get some idea of where it is that you're kind of trying to go, but then that, that starts to become a question of itself. Well, what is my ideal strength like? What's going to be the best version of coach for me? Well, that depends. These are some things that you need to know, and this, where the, this is where the purpose aspect of things come into place, because not everybody's going to want or have the same purpose. You need to think about yourself. Like who are the people that who are the people that you like to connect with that share your values, your identity, and your priorities? Matt Reynolds loves working with professionals in their mid thirties to mid forties and fifties. Dan Flanick likes to work with Youth Barbell Club. Did everybody see Youth Barbell Club just launched today? Yeah. Dan Flanick is like the most excited person in the world when he's talking about coaching teenagers. Matt Reynolds wants to kill himself when he's coaching teenagers. <laughs> so he has very different ideal coach values for what, for in terms of like what Matt wants to, who loves to work with. So his vision for what, who he wants to be, who he's striving to become is going to be very different as a coach. So you got to start thinking about your client, like who are the clients that you, that are important to you to, to help uh, get stronger. Another way of thinking about that is probably what Grillo was saying. What kinds of pain points do you guys want to solve? That's really what it's boiling down to. The teenager has pain points like um, that Dan talks about, like the, the things that happen. So here's, and really where I'm going with this is that we talk a lot about the mechanics of coaching, but what you end up actually doing as a coach, particularly if you're working with somebody over a long period of time, has less and less to do about those mechanics and more and more about the people that you're connecting with. So 
the types of pain points that Dan Flanick is working on are, my dad abused me. Uh, my parents just got divorced. And the gym is where I go to feel good. And the gym is what I can work on and make my life better. And it makes all of my other aspects of my life better when I'm consistent about showing up and getting stronger. Like that's what's happening in the real world with what we are doing. Yes, strength is what we anchor our work in. It's what we use as a vehicle to help people solve those pain points. But what you're actually going to be talking to your clients about is going to be some of this stuff. So think about who it is, what are those pain points that you actually like to solve and deal with on a day to day basis. And who's your market going to be? Who are the people that you want to appeal to and, and show yourself to that bring those pain points in? There's a gym in Chicago um, from a coach that was Dave Abdumule. I was asking him about his like what it's like in his gym. And he said there's times during peak gym hours, like five to six, where there's no music and everybody's reading a book in between sets. Dave is, and I don't for those that don't know Dave, like he's a super quiet, you know, smart, gentle guy, but the complete opposite of what most gyms are marketing to, which, you know, like this heavy metal or rap or, you know, blah, super bro culture. He's created this space, though, where his clients love that. They go because that's where they feel comfortable doing their work, doing their barbell training. So you can, if you, if you are intentional about the market that you want to create or approach or profit from by helping and what the pain points that you want to solve and the people that you like, you love to work with, that can help influence and shape the type of business that you create, the type of profession, professional that you want to be, the ideal strength coach that you're striving to be and you're learning to become. And it's all going to be specific to you and the people that you want to connect to. It's one of the things that, again, Barbell Logic, as we've talked about as the leadership team, is a company that's, it's, the service is primarily a connection service. We're connecting really good coaches with people that want to get stronger, that couldn't get stronger otherwise, primar mostly. I mean, some of them can go to a gym and, you know, there's other reasons that they work with us, but fundamentally what we're doing is helping coaches be who they want to be and work with the people that they want to work with. We're, our, the pain point that Barbell Logic so solves is helping people all over the world connect with coaches that are anchored in those core ideas of how to get stronger and what it means and how to effectively get stronger so that people can do what they love doing. But that same concept can happen if you want to open up a strength parlor. You know, Cody's got this gorgeous gym. I mean, look around this gym. This has got to be one of the most beautiful gyms in the country. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for sure on the block. <laughs> but this, this is Cody, right? Like this is his vision of what a beautiful gym looks like. There's probably some people that would walk in and be like kind of weirded out by it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you, this is where it gets to be fun for you as a professional barbell coach is figuring out what it is. What is important to you? Like, who do you want to be? Who do you want to connect with? The people that are best at understanding who they are and what they value are actually going to be the ones that are most effective out in the market. I think that was in the video that I included where CJ was talking about the guy who dresses up in unicorn was, did you guys see that in that video? No? Understanding. Well, so there's a gym in San Francisco, this guy who was a theater actor, right? Yeah. So he created like this disco themed, crazy, furry workout environment <laughs> that people love and they're paying a ton of money because it's fun and that they perceive that value and he's getting people stronger and in better shape and fit. But that I couldn't do that like that. I, mean, I could might be kind of fun actually, but <laughs> <laughs> but you're gonna have to figure out what that is. Um, the reason that I'm standing here today and having quit my job, actually my last day was almost exactly a year ago. Yeah. 
the the aha moment for me was about three months earlier over the winter holiday where I was reading some books about emotional intelligence, actually. And I had always thought, yeah, 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 emotional intelligence, empathy, like caring whatever the people's feelings are. But this was this um, it was a Harvard Business Review book was actually talking about the first part, the first step to being to having emotional intelligence is really understanding your values. Because if, if you're living your life in, a, in discord with your values, you're going to keep having these emotional reactions to things that don't, you don't understand. You don't know what's coming on. But really what it's, what's happening is that disconnect between your, your actions and your values. And what I had realized in thinking about that was that I had been making a bunch of professional decisions in my life, pursuing... Uh, jobs or companies to work for, climbing up this ladder, and I kept being successful in that those loops. Right, I wasn't perfect, but I was progressing up the ladder. I was getting promotions, these raises. I had everything that I thought that I wanted, but there was always this feeling like something was wrong, and I would keep having these big emotional outbursts or whatever, like not emotionally intelligent interactions with people, and it didn't make any sense. And it was this aha moment of realizing that I kept changing jobs or changing companies or chasing this thing that was totally not what I actually cared about. And since I've changed to this company, working with Barbell Logic, I'm, I'm now living in better alignment with connecting with people and spending time with people that I value, that share my values and my priorities. I can be myself. I, I actually live the identity of who I am rather than trying to be who I thought I should be as a corporate man, you know, middle manager or executive. The people I'm working with, my clients now, are people who have pain points that I like to solve rather than Boeing who's trying to optimize their, their stock price, which I don't have a problem with that. I, again, I don't want to make any, anybody here who's working in the corporate world, there's zero judgment against that, but that's not, I don't value that. I don't want to live that way, right? So that's the, the idea here is for you guys to think, and this is what we can come back to talking about on Sunday, you know, let that kind of spin in your head over the next couple of days, maybe in the background to think about like, what do you guys actually care about? Like, what do you value? Who do you want to connect with? When you're starting out, if you feel like you need to keep every client and make everybody yeah. happy and it, you can't do it, it's going to feel really high resistance and it starts to feel like a job just like anything else. Like if you don't, if, if this is out of line and if these are out of alignment, life sucks. You're, you don't feel like you're getting compensated for your time, what it needs to be, and you're not doing what you care about. So the, what's the PBC then? So the PBC is a means to connect your values, identity, and priority to your purpose. The tools that we talked about, how to get stronger, the black box, a learning culture, barbell logic, these are this brand, you know, adding value to your brand. By pursuing that is going to allow you to profit by helping people you love working with become stronger. That's the business of helping people become stronger. We don't have all the answers. We don't know that everything has to be a certain way, but we do have ways of thinking about it critically and tools of getting better as a coach and a culture that values failure as a learning opportunity and helping people understand their values and working towards their purpose. So we're, we're still early in this process, but this is kind of, this is, I think, where what Matt's vision is with Barbell Logic and what we're trying to do with professional barbell certification is different. You know, we're, we're encouraging more uh, flexibility with people to be their best version of themselves and connect with the people they love working with while still being anchored to those core concepts. So, you know, we're not doing the everything, do whatever model. We still want people to get stronger. We still want people to use barbells. We still find that to be an important means of doing this. But 
we still want to enable people to connect with those that they actually value. All right, well, that's a wrap on that lecture. Once again, if you want to follow along with the slides that Andrew referenced in this presentation, you can go to the show notes, and there's a PDF of that slide deck there. In the meantime, as always, if you like what we're doing, go to iTunes and leave us a review. Let us know what you think of the show. And if you're interested in attending one of these Professional Barbell Coach PBC seminars in the future, you can go to barbelllogic.com and click on the Events tab and see when the next PBC seminar is coming up. There's none on the calendar right now, but there will be more in the future. So you can keep an eye on that in the events page. And also, of course, check the Barbell Logic social media on Facebook and Instagram. All right. Thanks again for listening. We will see you in a couple days.